Good afternoon, everybody, and wish everybody a very happy Easter. Thank you for joining us this very special um, Sunday afternoon. We've got some very, very interesting guests with us today, and what promises to be a really insightful discussion on autism and mental health. And we thought, what better way to have this discussion than to um, than with people who live this experience? So our mental health professionals we've got with us um, are uh, they identify themselves as autistic as autistic adults who've recently been um, who've recently received a diagnosis. And to facilitate this discussion today, we have Praveen Madhur. Praveen goes by the pronouns he and they. Uh, Praveen is a therapist and a trainer with the mental health team at Umi Child Development Center in Mumbai. Guided by the narrative ideas and diversity and inclusion, Praveen co-creates multiple possibilities with disabled children, adults, families, and marginalized communities. And to make this possible, Praveen uses art, books, imagination, and playfulness to make visible people's lived realities and expertise. And uh, Praveen loves spending time with children, talking to his plants, riding bikes, and his cup of evening chai. So over to you, Praveen. Um, but just before that, um, we will have time for questions at the end. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat box, or you can use the emote icon to raise hand, and we'll invite you to ask your question in the question answer session. So all yours, Praveen. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. Uh, am I audible enough? Yes, you are, Praveen. Yes. So I'll introduce uh, our panelist. Uh, we have Asta, who is a registered MBACP psychotherapist working with children, young adults, and families in Delhi and CR India and across different settings. Uh, their approach and training are both grounded in cultural competency and trauma informed practice majorly fueled by relational and interpersonal work with marginalized communities. They work towards culturally relevant psychosocial inventions through a community-centered approach. And in that, identity becomes of primary importance. As a neurodivergent queer woman, their scholarship and practice lie in challenging the heteronormative by creating room for an inclusive and ethical practice. They're also pretty invested in cats, which easily constitutes 35% of their personality, personality as an adult. Welcome, Asta. We also have Anandita Kundu. Uh, they identify themselves as they, them, and she. Um, they are a certified trauma therapist from the Trauma Research Foundation, Boston, USA, and a certified queer affirmative psychotherapist. In their therapy work, they use existential feminist intersectional disability justice framework. They use an eclectic approach, integrating narrative techniques, IFS, DBT, body and somatic work within a social and disability justice framework. They work largely with folks navigating various forms of systemic oppression based on gender, sexuality and political social justice folks with trauma experiences, disabilities, and chronic pain. Central to their practice is the lived experience of neurodivergence, queer identity, chronic illnesses, and trauma. They have been featured and published in various newspapers over the years for their work. When they're not working, they're spending time with dogs and baking gluten-free recipes. Welcome, Anindita. <laughs> Um, can we have uh, the panelist pinned, if possible? Sure. Yeah. Um, Asta and Anandita, so um, you've been working with neurodivergent and autistic population for a few years now. Um, we're wondering what made you explore your autistic identity? Um, what made you think that you're autistic? How has that journey been for you? Who goes first? Should I go? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, hi, everyone. It is extremely weird to look at myself on the screen. <laughs> um, but to answer your question, um, what made me explore is 
honestly the constant discomfort in my body which understanding now i figure is the constant needs that my body had which were not being fulfilled by the environment i was in which caused the discomfort um it was not so much as working with the people that i worked with that made me curious but how i fit in there and how i had to um keep certain elements of what naturally came to me aside to fit into the idea of a therapist and as we all know when we imagine a therapist we really just imagine someone sitting back in a couch who is not stimming or perhaps uh, not quiet uh, or not using speech so i think that is where my that is when i decided that it was after creating a lot of support for myself to be able to go through the process i decided that it was time to figure out what was really going on after years of misdiagnosis medication and um endless discomfort like i mentioned uh, yeah you you talked about you know creating a lot of support for you um among this discomfort and also redefining this idea of therapist i'm wondering what did it make possible for you what did it allow you to be how was that it is i think i read this somewhere that once you get your autistic once you get your autism diagnosis as an adult it's really a beginning to figure out who you actually are because up until now it just feels like which um some one of my clients would call personality shopping which i think all of us have been doing all our lives and uh, so what that made possible for me is that i could validate my experience first second help me confront whatever imposter syndrome i had which i continue to have and will i'm pretty sure about that and then lastly to kind of acknowledge my challenges acknowledge my strengths acknowledge who i am to get to a point where i could honor that and then to feel like it is okay to create this ask for and have the support that i need and that is where i'm going towards <laughs> honoring is the part where i'm at right now so somewhere in the middle of creating support for myself and uh, just i think embracing all those different parts that had been shut aside for so many years thank you asta i just wanted to follow up with another question um you mentioned about creating that support for yourself um were there people who supported you in this journey and yeah and how did they contribute or how did that happen my therapist um uh, nidhi some friends and uh, when i meet people like you or anandita i think just support when you're autistic comes especially when you're an adult who has just been diagnosed and they don't fit into the idea of what disability looks like i think support can just be something as simple as community so having a whatsapp group where i have people i have never met but who will respond with same 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 every time i share something that support every time i can stim openly and freely in a space even if there's just one person present who knows that i do that that support if i have people i can call who can come take care of me when i don't have the energy to do that that support so it's the little things that support you thank you asta um we'll have more questions but um i'm wondering anandita would you like to answer same questions um especially around your exploration with your autistic identity firstly thank you so much for having me today i am extremely honored to be a part of this panel uh, and sharing this space with nidhi and praveen and asta thank you so much uh i like everything i agree and like everything that nidhi said, that asta said that uh, especially the part where asta mentioned about uh, 
personality shopping, right? And how we tend to honor different parts. For the longest period, I grew up with significant amount of trauma. So for the longest period of time, I kept feeling like, you know, the world is living in a bubble and I'm always outside of that bubble. Somehow the conversations I'm a part of or the groups I'm a part of, I don't fit in. And uh, when I started studying psychology, a lot of it made sense. And uh, then when I started studying uh, trauma, I, a lot of it made more sense. But in spite of, being, of undergoing trauma therapy for almost six years, medications and uh, various different avenues, something still didn't fit. So for me, a very significant turning point was uh, the present relationship, my partner. I think both of us explored our identities together because that was the first time I felt safe emotionally and I stopped masking. And I think as uh, people assigned female at birth, we tend to learn how to mask socially because that's how the society expects you to be. And you cannot be your authentic self or the part of, the part of you that needs to keep moving, that's not okay. The part of you that's hyperactive is not okay. The part of you that needs that stimming is not okay, right? So you keep getting shut in these boxes. And uh, for the first time when I stopped masking, a lot of those parts came out, right? And then in lack of better terms came out. Right? And when those parts emerged, I think one of the one of the things that happened was uh, me and my partner were having a discussion about uh, disabilities and neurodivergence, uh, and we were watching the series called Atypical, which is not autism shown perfectly, but we were just watching that, right? And uh, my partner made this comment: "Hey, that's a lot like you." And that was the first time I felt, oh my God, yes, because I have felt this way all my life. And uh, that got me thinking. And then I, Nidhi played a huge role in the diagnosis and uh, providing me that diagnosis and providing me the space to actually speak about a lot of these experiences that I don't think even the closest people in my life knew. I don't think I knew. I don't think I ever really looked at these different parts or allowed myself even glimpses of these different parts all my life. So, yeah, that I think sums up my journey. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I think when you're saying about you know, having these glimpses of different parts about yourself and also parts which, you know, constitute stimming, uh, being hyperactive and also identifying, you know, there's a lot like others. Um, what does this knowing of different parts about yourself now make possible for you? Has that changed anything for you? I think or what has it changed yeah. for that matter? Uh, one of the things that I think with the, I'll start with the diagnosis there, right? With receiving the diagnosis as an adult, I think a lot of the shame that I used to feel growing up consistently that like, why do I need to keep twirling this rubber band all the time just in order to soothe myself in some way, because if I am having a sensory experience, it's hard, right? And each time I would be having a sensory experience, there would be a huge sense of shame. And I think shame was a very big part. And uh, with the diagnosis, that part just became smaller and smaller and smaller each day. I don't think it's gone. I don't think I, I understand my autistic self completely. I'm still 
exploring i'm still understanding it each day i realize oh this is also a part of it and i get it it's so instead of oh my god what is up with me why am i behaving this way it became more curious than okay what's happening okay maybe i am feeling overloaded with the lights or the noise outside or if there's a construction i can choose to put on my headset instead of feeling i have to get through this right? this is something everyone does why can't i do it so i think shame is the bigger part that i was able to witness and that became smaller and smaller each day in a way that it can coexist with everything else thank you anandita and um you mentioned about you know your therapist and your partner um were there other people who kind of supported you uh, in this journey of exploration especially around um battling or like you know challenging this shame that yeah seems to be yeah yeah there. i think for me uh like asta said community played a huge role so my partner yes definitely nidhi very big part of this process for me my therapist yes however i think the bigger part that uh, i started writing quite a bit about my chronic illness journey and chronic pain journey on instagram through which i got into got in touch with quite a bit of people who are disabled either living with dynamic disabilities or neurodivergence and uh, knowing their experiences made mine more real so it just allowed me to feel more validated even if i wasn't talking about it i was still hearing their experiences and that made mine i like i felt validated through those so community became a big part of it for me yeah. yeah and and i've been hearing this word uh, validating uh, yeah, valid. either through diagnosis or either through other people honoring and supporting your identity why is that uh, of such importance you think in your own experiences uh for me so i i truly believe that when we are in spaces like you know uh, even in therapy the biggest thing that as a therapist i can provide my client is the sense that i believe you right whatever that experience may be i believe you and uh, that for me is a very central uh part of uh exploring or growth to even to understand to even hear from someone that i believe you when you say that you need to keep fidgeting with something and i'm not questioning you that affirmation is what allows the the part that feels shame to get smaller so for me that validation is that affirmation that i believe you that each time you say that hey i cannot sit in this white light i believe you so i'm going to provide you with a warm light so that you are not feeling sensory overload and just merely saying that i believe you and i get it that it's hard so that allows me to feel less shame and open up more and not mask not feel the need to mask so yeah yeah Uh, Asta, would you like to respond as well? And it's okay if you don't want to answer. I don't think I could have phrased it any better. But the same, the same part that you're talking about—the one that carries the shame for us, the one that has to go into hiding every single time we feel unsafe—it becomes a little bit more known. It feels a little bit more safe, and to that. i think that need to be loved and cherished i think it begins with being seen and seeing someone just seeing them 
and believing them that that's the validation and the affirmation that you need to keep on going so i'm on board with everything that you said yeah you also mentioned about therapy and uh, people supporting you in this journey um and i think when we think about autism we think of it as a social communication condition that's the dominant idea and most of uh, people do not recognize or even aware that about the mental health concerns that uh, often come with it and from your experience um around your own diagnosis and your own journey um uh, what impact does mental health have is the correlation between autism and mental health is what i'm talking about yes. yeah especially for the neurodivergent and autistic folks i could begin but i would want anandita to at some point elaborate more on the trauma bit and how that shows up in the body especially for people who are autistic specifically for the for for the for this conversation um mental health challenges when you are autistic um, i can speak from my my own experience of having to mask um being shunned from spaces either because people don't want me there or because mm-hmm. that space will never accommodate me i cannot walk in there and feel safe without knowing i could push myself but that comes with trauma i could push myself a little bit more but that leads to more shutdown it leads me to feeling unsafe it led me to misdiagnosis it led me to medication i did not need it led me to struggling at my job it led me to being told by the mental health community that i was a part of that what a therapist looks like and how that's not me or how i might be identifying with my clients or how um there needs to be some sort of a differentiation of some kind or being told that a therapist is supposed to speak or what your silence cannot convey so all these different parts that just needed to exist and could be used could be used and deserve to be honored in their own right were actually just told to go back into hiding go back into hiding you don't belong here you don't belong here you don't belong here over and over and over again either actively or through the messages that you receive growing up so what that does to a person i don't think i have the words to to capture that i know the pain it causes my clients and i know the pain it has caused me and yeah i think that it is autism is truly more than a more than an autism speaks definition of it or some blue colors or rainbow puzzles i think it's very real lived experiences of actual human beings that will never be alike but they deserve to be honored and they deserve to be understood and they deserve to be supported and cared for and loved so to answer that question i don't think there are enough words in the english uh, vocabulary to suffice what it does but you cannot talk of any disability or autism without thinking of the mental health challenges that come with it because those are created by society some are your own but for the most part for disability it's a failure on society then so that was my rant <laughs> can you hear me yeah yes oh i think i'll start with the trauma bit because that's a little more tangible for me to answer that mental health as a broader perspective because that's a lot i think uh, living with autism is like a series is like for, for me and few of my clients it has been a series of traumatic events 
because like asta said you cannot talk about any disability per se without talking about the failure of the society to understand the differences uh if the differences were neuro divergence and the differences were act accepted and understood and heard by people around autistic people i think a lot of that trauma can dissipate at a very grassroots level so this is something i would quote uh peter levine talks about it he's a trauma expert like a pioneer in the field and he says that how do you differentiate an experience from it being traumatic and it not being traumatic the biggest difference is the presence of an empathetic other when a person is going through an experience whether it be uh an autistic experience or whether it be a non autistic experience right the presence of an empathetic other is something that allows that experience to settle in as trauma or not as trauma and i think what people with neurodivergence and disability lack is that empathetic other and uh, the more we can work towards that that becomes safer so for me in my experience uh trauma mental health conditions chronic pain right and at this point i would like to mention what asta said how does trauma show up right in autistic people in their bodies there is a very high correlation between autism and chronic pain and uh, there is a very high correlation between trauma and chronic pain and i think the intersection is the somatics here because when you uh when you learn to not stim not be impulsive you start dissociating from your body and the more you dissociate from your body and how any emotion or uh, any experience sits in your body the sensations in your body right the more you dissociate because you're not allowed to understand where your body is in that moment right? the more you dissociate the more that energy right that gets stored in your system and the more it gets stored in your system the more that there is a shutdown hence a lot of us experience consistent shutdowns where we are not allowed to when we are not allowed to stim or when we are not allowed to express or do something with the body that the body needs in that moment so any whether it be a traumatic experience or whether it be a difficult emotion has a sensation to start with and that sensation is what gets stored either it gets stored as a traumatic experience within the body or it needs to be released so stimming is one form of allowing your body to release that sensation of that difficult sensation and uh, yeah so in my practice with my clients i think somatic work and that's why sensory integration is something that helps a lot i found somatic work to also help and uh, in my own experience i think learning more about somatics allowed me to find different ways of stimming in different situations even if it's a it's a professional setup and i cannot be rocking right what else can i be doing so understanding uh the somatics of understanding the soma the body is something that really really helped me find different ways of uh, soothing
yeah that is the trauma bit i hope i answered i don't know i have a tendency to de- deviate and go to different tangents so feel free to bring me back <laughs> but uh, yeah when it comes to mental health uh, anandita yeah. uh, before we proceed uh, some people have asked uh, can you give some examples of chronic pain I don't know why I keep going on mute. I'm so sorry. Uh, so one of the things from the research point of view, I would say that there's been, it's been, uh, there is, a, there is, even though it's in a preliminary stage, there is, uh, people have found, researchers have found that uh, musculoskeletal pain, amplified sense of pain, uh, chronic pain is high in people with autism in autistic people and uh, some of the examples could be a lot of people are misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia however if you see fibromyalgia is a is an exclusionary diagnosis and uh, when when none of the other biological aspects fit in for the pain that's when people get diagnosed with fibromyalgia however the way the pain pathways work in uh, autistic people because of the sensory aspects fibromyalgia gets slapped as a diagnosis i'm not saying everybody who's diagnosed with fibromyalgia is autistic that's not the correlation that i'm talking about however a lot of people who are autistic are misdiagnosed with the uh, exclusionary pain conditions like fibromyalgia instead of autism so when i have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and post my autism diagnosis when i went back to my pain doctor and i spoke to him about it he changed my medications he's like okay that makes sense and that does not fit in the criteria of autism because amplified because of the sensory sensitivity that uh, autistic people have there can be a heightened experience of pain or a lower than normal experience of pain so i'm talking about the heightened aspect where fibromyalgia is also a heightened experience of pain so one of the examples of chronic pain can be fibromyalgia i'm not going to go into the biological aspects of each disease but uh, but yeah like one of the examples of that people autistic people also experience chronic fatigue quite a bit which is again may not be chronic fatigue syndrome per se alone in itself but uh, it could be big stemming from the autistic experience of sensory overload consistent sensory overload so yeah like if that helped in understanding chronic pain a little yeah thank you anandita um i'm also hearing that how you know environment plays a huge part in this uh right from where, what asta mentioned about having that support uh of fulfilling environment of people who acknowledge who honor uh, who also validate the autistic experience and these sensory issues that are stemming and the world which is disabling around um but i'm also hearing about shame uh, which is coming in from certain expectations of how a person should be uh, as if there is a standard to live up to uh, and you know often hearing from other autistic folks it's you know they always calling it as um, neurotypical standards or ways of living as if it's a box to fit in um i'm also hearing shunning from spaces or not accommodating uh, autistic needs and there are misdiagnoses uh, which you know autistic experiences labeled as something different or diagnosed as something different i'm also hearing a lot about the community which is supportive which is believing which is validating um which is honoring uh, which also acts like the presence of the empathetic person um uh, in throughout this journey of exploration um 
since you both are autistic mental health professionals working with neurodivergent folks um, and autistic folks. Um, how has it been for you uh, in terms of a therapist or professional? Um, what does that bring to your therapeutic space? Are there things or little things that you bring in which others may not have imagined? go first wow. uh, so I'll answer this question in two parts one is uh, I think as therapists irrespective of whatever modality you are trained in you're expected to be perfect you're, like there is an underlying expectation how therapists need to be put together, perfect, dressed appropriately, looking perfect, their hair being perfect, everything about them has to be this, like there's this air around being a therapist. And I feel from the start, because now I know, now I understand that because I'm autistic, these norms never made sense to me. I never understood why I needed to be perfect. The why was never good enough for me to understand right? because now I understand that that's my autistic self that doesn't understand the social norms as much right? and questions them right? so in my career path I have always tried to not be that perfect person so when my clients ask me that hey how are you or how how have things been with you? I answer honestly that this was a hard week because for me, I feel when I do that, it allows my client to do that as well and not try to be as perfect as I pretend to be. So a lot of the things that I've studied in my grad school really didn't make sense, like counter transference, transference. Right? For me, all of those are human experiences. And I understand them as human experiences because now I understand that, hey, I'm autistic. So of course, these things don't make sense to me because this is a human experience. And why shouldn't I look at the attachment that I feel for my client? Or why shouldn't my client be attached to somebody who they've been working for, for with six years? So when you... That's one part of it, that the expectation to be perfect. For me, it was easy to let go, but I totally understand for a lot of people, it's not. How the, the second part of it, where you asked that, what do you bring to the table? Kind of that, right? Like your autistic self, how does that show up in sessions? I think one of my... Uh, special interests is research. So because I'm autistic, I'm either all in with the client or I'm not. So there is no midway for me. And if I'm all in with the client, I work extremely hard to understand what is going on with my client, what is happening, why are they experiencing what they are experiencing, even if that means I have to read and research different modalities that uh, I have never studied. Even if that means I have to learn a whole different modality, take up a different course to learn that modality to work with my client. It's a part of who I am as, as an autistic therapist that I'm all in. Either I'm all in or I'm not taking you up as a client because I don't have the bandwidth. So I think for me, that shows up in my sessions with my clients as well, where I'm a part of every diagnosis process that they go through. I'm a part of whether it is a chronic illness diagnosis. I want to talk to their doctors. I want to talk to their th psychiatrists. So because I don't 
that that's again a part of my autistic self that I don't care if the psychiatrist thinks I'm a pain in the ass or whatever. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just irritating them or whatever. I am here to advocate for my clients, so I'm going to do that. So that's just what my autistic self brings to the table as a therapist, right? And the yeah. So that is one part of it. The other part of it, I think, when my clients say. that they are experiencing that they don't fit in in spaces whether it be because of their gender expression because of their uh, disabilities because of their neurodivergence i get it i get what that means when you don't fit in and you're living in a different bubble and the world is moving at a different pace and you keep feeling like you are stuck in a slow motion or something where you're never able to reach that space and you're constantly trying so i get it when they say that and i truly truly get it so i think that's my autistic self as well so yeah yeah i'm curious more about this truly getting in but i'll come to that part um i'm also like uh, curious to hear from asta around yeah like what are some of the things that you bring um yeah being an autistic professional mental health professional i think it is quite terrifying and um, exciting that no book no supervisor no therapist no colleague no friend and uh, practically nobody in the community will be able to capture it just as it is so i think if you think about it we're kind of just bringing it along the way cuz i don't know who to look up to i don't know another senior autistic therapist person who can say that hey you could work like this or hey you could do this or hey this is you this is what you might be feeling they're all relying on models and theories and subgroups and people where you will never imagine a disabled therapist you will not even imagine a disabled client per se if you if i think of my school of thought alone i i don't fit in there it made no sense to me my clients did not fit in there i don't know what i was doing i don't know what they were doing and to kind of just figure it out along the way has been truly really terrifying and very exciting but that means that it gives us so much opportunity if you have the fight in you but sometimes gets really tiring really really tiring and alone but when you keep on fighting that passion it just never dies and in that i think you're able to build a space for yourself and your clients where all these parts of you can exist there's nothing that we need to really keep aside there's nothing that we need to say hey this doesn't belong to us or hey this is not okay just because you don't understand it and i am still figuring it out i don't know how how it changes the dynamic between me and my clients when say i'm working in person and i really need to stim and what will what that might do to our equation if it is a neurotypical client or what it might do to our equation if i disclose something or if i just go same or if i go quiet what if i lose my speech um in the middle of a session so in a way what if i stop acting more new, more like a neurotypical therapist that i have seen all my life and embrace more of my own being and conflate it with the therapy process i think that is what i really want to figure out and i'm trying to figure out and i hope that when all these models are thought through and talked about we will find that space too but i think that's the only way that autistic people can be helped i don't know if that answers the question though um i i think so um i'm i'm hearing that you know you're talking about figuring it out along the way and also i think you know someone who is exploring my own neurodivergence and you know i'm i often wonder how it looks like because there's a no there's no set prototype or people to kind of refer or even look up to right and uh, there's all, also shame and uh, there's also a lot of questioning around you're not um, neurodivergent or autistic enough uh, because you can talk you can communicate you can crack jokes um 
but some of the subtleties around sensory issues or the high anxiety or even chronic illnesses that Anandita mentioned, uh, they get lost or they're not visible enough or the social withdrawal aspect for that matter. Um, Asta, I'm also hearing you say about, um, you know, the challenges with um, sharing your own diagnosis with a client um, or maybe, you know, people questioning you in the therapeutic space. Um, how, how does that work out? How do you respond to um, situations like this? Um, Anindita, feel free to pitch in as well. I think it's very different and of course it will be impacted by my own internalized ableism, by the, the, the people I'm surrounded by, which is again, neurotypical therapists. And just speaking in the role of a therapist alone, I think it really helps the process, especially with when you're working with other neurodivergent people to disclose. And I've been doing that now. I was still on the fence before if you would have asked me a year and a half ago, I, was, I would have probably lied or still would have wondered, should I, should I not, will it help? I don't know what it will do. What will I be like if I told them? So on and so forth. But now I've gotten to a point where I just do. And I feel like that that's challenging. I'm, I'm going to go back to that part that Anandita brought in in the beginning, that, that shame part. That's how you make it smaller. So we make it smaller for as long as we can and whatever it takes. Um, I'm still figuring it out what it would be like to disclose it to people, my clients who have not known, who still view me as this therapist, therapist, <laughs> and not a disabled therapist. But uh, that's a journey I'm on. And we'll figure that out along the way. But yeah, I'm going to take, I'm going to hold on to that, um, that part that's been made to feel shame because it was not provided enough space and fight for it as much as we can. I, I would like to add to everything that Asta said, that that is a way of making that part that feels shame smaller. I think for me, uh, now after, because initially I have not been diagnosed, I, I, my diagnosis for, of autism is uh, pretty recent, like uh, last year, November, but uh, I have still been uh, talking to my clients about my chronic illness because that's a very significant part of my everyday life. Like there are days that I can't get out of bed at all. So, and it changes from hour to hour. So I think over the years, what has happened for me is it's become more of a choice than the fact that I need to do it because I've never spoken about it, so I need to tell. So now it's more of a choice. For me, reading expressions is a little hard, right? So I may not always exactly understand from my client's expression what they are feeling. So those are the moments that I take to talk to my clients that I may ask you quite a bit of times that, how whatever I mentioned in the session, how does that sit in with you or how does that feel for you? And uh, I may ask you that quite a bit. That's primarily because I find it hard to read facial expressions. So it allows my client to also have an understanding of what autism can look like and how different it can look like for different people. So then there are moments where I end up having conversations with my clients about autism in general, right? Not specifically about me, it may not always be about me, but in general, but yeah, like, like Asta said, like, you know, it's still a part where we are figuring it out. How do you speak about something that may or may not be taken well? 
that may or may not sit in well with the other and to know that whether it is going to or not is the part where I personally feel it's a lot of courage to get out there and say that hey you know I'm as vulnerable as you are so yeah thank thank you both for i think bringing your vulnerability as well um especially with all the shame and stigma and apprehensions and gray areas that are associated uh with you know sharing about your own identity in the therapeutic space um i'm moving on to the next question um the you know from the earlier understanding about autism being very white uh, cis boys uh, uh, something that happens to boys primarily to more and more women coming coming up with self diagnosis or even people questioning their gender uh, fear folks uh, identifying themselves as autistic there are a lot of overlaps happening um someone also asked about how have your gender identities affected your experience of neurodiversity and yeah how do you see the intersectionalities if you want to talk about it a bit i go right okay <laughs> this is a this is fun <laughs> um i think um it goes on this this part of me goes on to question authority gender norms power dynamics sexuality disability and heteronormativity heteronormativity all along all of it i don't think i can pick out pieces i think the way that you I I can't generalize this for all autistic folks but I do know that when you have an experience of being marginalized to try and understand a self that idea of a self who I is when I is not allowed to exist when I is told that I doesn't belong when I is made to feel shame when I is not fitting in when I is everything but how I should be to be a part of a functional society so to speak then i will question or i will suppress and i think uh, that's where i guess where the conflation happens where where you wonder where you try to question because everything that you've been fed has never really made sense for you it's not just um of course being disabled and then being unseen for 20 30 years is a huge part of it but then you're also complying to so many other things when you're masking especially as a woman or as a queer person i think that experience of marginalization is is very similar to that because you have to have to go into hiding because if you exist as you are you will be killed you your life is literally at stake so when you question that when you have the freedom and the liberty to question that and the privilege that i think that i have i know if i did not have the privilege that i did to kind of understand these things in a language that i can speak i wouldn't be able to or to kind of just walk into the street and make it back home alive so when you have those things you begin to question and that's where i got to questioning who am i as a queer person who am i as an autistic person who am i as a woman i don't know i'm figuring it out because this what i have here does not make sense to me and i think when you break out of those binaries which being autistic kind of just i think it's that default setting to not just agree to it it just doesn't make sense <laughs> either give us a legitimate argument or drop your cause <laughs> it makes no sense so i think you you do tend to question you cannot not question the binary it makes no sense because if that continues to make sense you don't fit in you pick that model up and you apply everywhere 
And that's where you question your sexuality. That's where you question your gender identity. That's where you try to break out of the binaries that you've been forced fed all your life. So um, I feel like intersectionality is the key to our being, but it becomes all the more relevant and all the more important in the therapeutic space when you're working with any community that has been historically marginalized and continues to be, which would be, well, basically everyone who is not a cisgendered heterosexual white man. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> and then, would you like to add something? I don't think I could have said any this any better, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I think when you are not born into the charm circle, you start questioning. So when you are not this is head white man, or if we are, look at the charm circle from an Indian context, when you are not the cis head man, right, Brahmin man, you tend to start questioning, right? Because you are somewhere outside of the charm circle all your life. And uh, I think the for me, my gender identity as a non-binary person uh, has the exploration has happened parallelly the understanding has come parallelly as well because i think it's the it's my autistic self that is that doesn't comply to the social norms because it doesn't really understand the social norms as much so, so when when i was a kid and i was always told that hey eat after dad is done eating I never really understood why I'm hungry right now. Why am I supposed to wait for someone else to get done eating? Why can't everybody eat together? Why can't everybody, everything happen this way? Right? So it does not make sense. That's the crux. And when one system does not make sense, you tend to question the other systems as well. And I think questioning comes very naturally to a lot of autistic people. We are just told and taught not to. So if we just allow ourselves to question these binaries, these uh, modalities, these boxes that we are supposed to be ticked into, if we allow ourselves to question a lot of autistic folks if you see the, the, there's such a similarity, gender is a spectrum and so is autism. And uh, the, there's a very big reason why it's a spectrum, right? We are all different. And if we are allowing ourselves to question and understand these uh, non-binaries, it's really important that we do that. So, yeah, I think for me, that's the part where I, it never really made sense. So I, Either I comply or I question. So I was okay questioning, but I know for a lot of people it may it doesn't come that naturally to question because especially female-bodied people, especially people who are female assigned at birth, it's not always easy to question. So yeah. However, I think in our moments, in our personal moments, we still allow ourselves to question. So if we can just access those parts, that could be a very significant part that helps you in the journey. Yeah. And you know, throughout this questioning around the social norms, um, the expectations from the functional society and uh, through ableism, uh, capitalism, uh, the charm circle that you mentioned. Um, we know that, you know, autistic folks, marginalized folks, queer folks have created worlds for themselves because the existing world is too intense, not tolerable, not accommodating enough. Um, I'm wondering if you would like to talk about autistic joy or queer joy that uh, that people experience and often talk about um, those moments where you know that make you feel yourself um, moments and spaces that you created or communities that you know that acknowledge and honor you the right way that you would want them to be or partners 
who value your therapist and doctors who support you or a sense of self which is you know self fulfilling without the external need for validation yeah it was too verbose but i'm just hoping that you want to talk something so oh, i think about, i love yeah. the question i'm just thinking where to begin <laughs> uh artistic joy queer joy i think for me queer joy has been to a very big part of like from the time i was a kid i always really really understood men's fashion and i liked clothes that are loose and uh that are mostly shirts and pants and things like that for me queer joy and uh queer joy for me would be that that i'm allowing myself more and more to express the way i want to even if that means that uh i wear men's clothes and i wear earrings along with it that's just who i am right so allowing myself to express that and uh, people around me celebrating that or people around me accepting that so i think that's a part of queer joy for me maybe very small but that's just that was a big win for me right and uh, artistic joy i'm still exploring i think for me one of the biggest winning moments was i recently adopted a dog and i could go to the shelter and say that hey i'm autistic so i have a very specific requirement and uh, they understood they got it so yeah i think when for me my autistic joy is when i am having an extremely difficult experience like right? i'm having sensory overload like just yesterday i was having a huge meltdown right? and i went into my room i switched off the lights and i didn't want anyone near me so i kind of threw my partner out of the room i told him go and my dog just came he jumped on i was lying on the bed my dog just came he jumped on me and he literally sat on me and just the weight of him breathing on me allowed me to breathe in that moment so it was kind of co regulation that the both of us were doing and i could just like he was there i could just hold him and cry and he didn't expect me to be any different for me that's a big autistic joy so yeah if that makes sense to anyone like i love dogs so you can make sense of that <laughs> yeah i was so eerie and wholesome because something very similar happened yesterday with me also <laughs> but no dog two cats instead <laughs> but something very similar and i relate so much and um, i think the most immediate autistic joy is when uh, nidhi put us all in a group and i was just like you exist you exist you exist i'm not the only one <laughs> Oh my god i could cry <laughs> that was just everything because it's what five six years doing this and for the first time i can just say do exist i'm not alone and that's that is unparalleled that feeling for me because i felt that isolation in my work so much and so deeply that that's a joy i don't know if that counts as autistic it or as a joy but that's a joy for queer joy also i think just having people around me like you said when you said that have someone celebrate you when you express yourself i i had goosebumps when you said that so that's such a luxury that is such a privilege and that is so beautiful to have to to feel that when you get to feel that and that's the power of human experience when it comes from empathy and uh, i i known what it feels like and i think that's everything that's why we do what we do and that's why we're having this conversation and that's why we try as much as we do even when we even when we're exhausted and have our um shutting lights off hiding in the blanket moments so yeah those are the joys that kind of 
see us through through it all. Yeah. I'm just going to let those words sink in for people and also for you to have a minute to maybe get some water or something or just you know, be yourself. Um, I'm not going to summarize uh, for the same reason, um, but we do have a Q&A session uh, for 15, 20 minutes, uh, I think, or we can stretch depending on how people are feeling. So maybe one minute break if people are okay. Meanwhile, we'll go through questions. Is it okay for us to begin? Um, there are some really interesting questions. Um, one of them is a person asking, what to do when I cannot anticipate certain social norm and then people start pushing me hard for not understanding their weird age appropriate expectations? Yeah, because social norms can be so tricky with so many layers of unpacking, understanding. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is quite challenging to fight people who are convinced in how the world works. But I would encourage you to, if, if that's possible, if you have the bandwidth and the capacity, I would encourage you to stand tall on your boundaries if you can because I feel like you would know your boundaries you would know internally what will not make sense to you and you will know the second your body feels uncomfortable hold on to that and stand your ground if you can if it is safe enough for you to do so it's okay to admit that this is something that does not make sense even if it makes sense to all the 50 other people around you it's hard, it's challenging. They probably will not appreciate it. But it's better than the discomfort that you might have to put yourself through. And of course, I'm, I'm saying this in a very decontextualized manner. I don't know the situation here. But um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, there's a, another follow-up question on the same, that for folks who are not as expressive, um, also I'm assuming uh, because, you know, when we talk about uh, autism spectrum, it's, it's a wide array of different aspects and communication can be many fold. Some people are speaking, non-speaking, some use assistive technology or uh, writing or drawing or even signs to express. Uh, folks who are not expressive uh, as you are right now, how do they understand the chronic pain, the anxiety? Uh, I'm also wondering what kind of support should we provide for kids who are growing up so that they can develop these skills or use some of the skills needed to express? Uh, so are we talking about like 
how do we support parents in understanding this or uh, sorry i'm a little mixed up yes so the question originally for parents okay. um okay. suggestion for parents uh both kids are not so expressive yeah I will talk about it from a personal perspective uh, as to what has helped me in understanding a partner who is not so expressive. So it might be different when it comes to kids because they may have difficulty articulating. However, it's really as a parent or a partner or a caregiver, it would help to understand how their body changes when they are anxious. Do they tend to shut down? Are they speaking even lesser? Right? Do they use different forms of stimming when they're anxious? Right? Like uh, I get really, really fidgety with my legs when I'm really anxious. So somebody who knows me very closely knows that this is a body language for me when I'm anxious. So I think chronic pain might be a little more challenging to understand. But I have seen a lot of kids express that everything hurts or I don't like wearing pants or something like that because they may not know exactly what is hurting. But talking to them about what's, why is it that they don't like wearing pants or is it paining for them? Is the elastic is something that hurts on their skin? Is it too much sensitivity? Right? So I think understanding their body, connecting with your child's body or your uh, understanding what their body language changes. Sometimes, uh, like when I was working in a school, a kid who was autistic would constantly ask for hugs when they are really overwhelmed and they wanted to hug. And they didn't, that's how I learned that they are overwhelmed because they didn't know how to tell me that they are overwhelmed and what they are overwhelmed about. So incorporating art for them to express what's happening can also be a big space for them. Just providing the kid that space that, hey, are you overwhelmed? Giving them the language, are you feeling overwhelmed? Are, sometimes they may not know what is overwhelming. So giving them the options, is it the lights, the sounds? You can nod, you don't have to tell me, you can use colors to tell me if it's okay or not. So like just, connecting with that part that they don't know what it is. So, yeah, I don't know if I gave out the, like, I, I don't know if I answered the question, but for me, these are the things that have helped. Yeah. Um, also, um, since, you know, I, um, I work in a setting, um, where like, you know, we, we have many parents and many kids, autistic kids coming in. Uh, one of the things I learned from uh, autistic folks and caregivers, uh, fellow doctors and therapists is um, advocating for the child's needs uh, mm -hmm. and develop that skill so that the child can advocate for themselves. And one of the thing was the skill of learning to say no. I was in talk with an autistic person, an advocate recently, and they said, if I could learn one thing, that would be, you know, to say no to things. Uh, no when, you know, things were going against my wishes. No when things were harmful or hurting me. No when the lights were too harsh. And no when I was going through, you know, intense stimming period and people were expecting something from me. Yeah, so I, I wonder, like, uh, what are some of the ways we can teach or even learn for these signs when children are communicating to us or adults are communicating to us. Yeah, so the learning may happen both sides and not just one way. Yeah. Uh, can I add something? Surely. That's okay. I really like the part where you said no, 
when something's difficult for me because i'm just connecting this to how living with autism is like living is is a continuous sense of trauma it even harsh lights can be traumatizing for someone who's autistic and when we are in that experience of trauma language often goes out of the window so allowing your kids single words that they can say which is not full sentences that might be too hard for them to formulate in that moment it to correctly say what is happening because as adults we can't do that so when kids are experiencing overwhelming emotions that might be even harder so allowing just a no and then giving them options as adults that hey you know is it the light do you not want it is it the sound do you not want it so they can just nod if that works that allows them to then that that just brought up that sense for me because language is often the higher cortical functioning which is not something that we can access when we are undergoing a very difficult experience hence comes the body so allowing them just single words can be very very important i'm going to read out the next question there are like array of questions to choose from um so there's someone asking um what advice would you have for an autistic person who is trying to approach therapy for the first time any tips or suggestions because we see therapy there are like many interpretations or ideas about it or stereotypes and it can be quite um overwhelming or even confusing um what would be helpful for a person to approach or seek support Praveen would you mind copy pasting it on the chat once sorry just did that tips advice i think those would remain the same for anybody approaching therapy and i think the bare minimum remains that when you are with someone when you meet someone you have the privilege and the opportunity to check in with yourself if you are feeling safe or not try to have your own little checklist some whatever you know that if i'm feeling unsafe or overwhelmed maybe um what i do is that maybe my swimming increases or maybe i feel the need to scratch my head or maybe i will stop speaking suddenly or i will feel threatened in my body and you will feel that how you feel that you would know but i think the first first qualifier for any therapeutic space has to be if you feel threatened or not so if you're feeling threatened then we need to rethink what's really going on there what's happening in the dynamic that's making you feel so second if you're approaching someone who's a therapist you have the liberty to ask them well in advance all the questions that you have you don't have to meet for a consultation without checking with them are they queer affirmative do they have the proper training that they need are they in supervision do have they ever been in personal therapy are they disability affirmative what experience do they have working with disabled clients do they understand autism what's their understanding of autism you you can ask these questions you don't even have to sit through an experience checking and feeling someone out whether they're going to be safe enough or not it's okay to do your research well in advance to ask and also i would i would say that uh, rather than googling or i don't know how to find therapists but rather than googling maybe maybe speak to people in the community they might be able to come up with um recommendations of people whom they have tried and tested so that kind of narrows it down to still decent therapists um everything else i trust can be figured out along the way 
this is really the basics. This is really the most basic thing that you need is to know whether this person is affirmative to your experience or not and whether you feel affirmed by them or not in that session. Um, Anandita, is there anything else that you would want to add to this? Uh, no, I think you said everything perfectly. I think have your checklist. Just one thing, even out, even if the therapist fits all your check, everything on your checklist, and uh, it's really important to see when you are experiencing a session, how is the therapist sharing power, or are they holding it with themselves? Right? Do they feel they are the expert? in your experience of it or do they allow you to be the expert of your experience and let them know what it's like so i think that's a very big part of it because if you're not sharing the power it becomes really difficult to be who you are in that space or access different parts of you yeah um, the chat box is like filled with question and also experiences. Do check it out um, if you get time. Um, I'm moving on to another question. Um, yeah, where are the spaces for autistic queer young adults to find romantic partners? How can we support them in navigating that space? I'm also adding one more thing. Are you aware of any spaces online or offline where Queer autistic folks, um, yeah, can connect with each other. I don't know about romantic partners because uh, that's a hard one for me to answer. But uh, however, I do know uh, spaces like pages on Instagram where you can be a part of the community. There is Revival Disability Magazine. They are, uh, it's run by disabled folks. A lot of them are autistic, queer. And uh, there is, so yeah, like pages like that. That is one, one part of it. I don't know too many, so I may not be the right person to ask that, is the answer this question. But this is one space that I can think of from the top of my head. Yeah, pause for perspective. But I, however, I don't know if they have like a open space where you can just join in, do they? Yeah, I think it's group oh. sessions. People can sign up yeah, for the sessions. Yeah. yeah. Asta, would you like to add um, or in chat box whenever you would like to? I don't know much about spaces because I'm not on social media. The only space I have access to is a WhatsApp group. And if, if you would want, I can share the details I have of, I have of these two groups. Um, so I think there's, there's a Google form you have to fill to join and that's really about it, but it's for queer autistic folks. And um, I, I, I'll share it with Nidhi or uh, maybe put it on the chat box if I'm able to right now and whoever wants it could access that. Give it a shot. I think we, we can do that. Like if we come across any spaces, we can share it with Nadi and then whoever wants that yeah. can access that. Yeah, I think we'll make a photo yeah. list and then just share yeah. it. Hi. Um, we have Anand Bala who would like to ask some inputs on trauma. Uh, would that be okay to take a question on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I hope I'm able to uh, everyone. Yeah. Yes, Anand. So, uh, thanks, thanks, Praveen. So essentially, I mean, uh, this is, I essentially completely concur with the thoughts that were already spoken about on autism and trauma by Asta and Anandita. So I, I'm just going to here to, I'm just going to try and add some points is that, uh, I mean, I wanted, I wanted to use this opportunity to question the efficacy of the, the 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 therapeutic techniques that are already in existence that address autistic trauma because uh, I mean uh, as uh, Anandita and Asta would agree the very nature of trauma and autism is different I mean like you know we I mean you use the word chronic that I agree with but to which I also would like to add the term complex you know so many autistic adults autism does not 
cause any complex trauma, but as we all know that the hostile environment, the hostile society, the ableism that is surrounding the autistic community has caused complex trauma in many autistic adults. And given the fact that the, like, given the, given the I, if I may use the word, uh, uh, the neural makeup uh, of autism is such that that we, which can be by and large applied to, applied to the large part of the spectrum is that the cognitive investment that we put in for anything is so high, you know? And so it becomes that much hard for us to cognitively disinvest from any bad experience as well, trauma. So I was wondering if how many people, uh, I mean, how it is very, very important for uh, like, uh, I mean, even for uh, people who are coming from uh, uh, an expertise in the trauma uh, field, I think it is very, very important for them to understand that uh, autism, autistic trauma really requires a, a different approach from the existing techniques that address post-traumatic stress disorder. And I would really be happy to hear your inputs on that because that's my strong feeling. And, uh, and uh, I personally advocate that uh, I mean, autistic adults suffer from complex and chronic PTSD because of a very repetitive nature of traumatic events that have, they, they themselves have ex experienced due to a hostile environment. So I want to make that very clear. Autism does not cause trauma, but people cause autistic people a lot of trauma. That I think I could say that, yeah. Uh, I'm really glad that you mentioned that autism does not cause trauma because that is really, that, that is extremely true. While there is a correlation, it's not a cause and an effect relationship. And uh, I don't think, I agree with you, I don't think the existing models of CBT and uh, that talk about trauma are actually addressing autistic trauma. Autistic trauma is complex in nature and uh, it is really important for the trauma therapist to understand autism while they are working with autistic trauma. I think when it comes to trauma, it's really, really important that the therapist is trained in trauma modalities. And I'm not talking about CBT or behavioral techniques at all. I'm not talking about directive behavioral techniques at all. I'm talking about techniques more on the lines of IFS or somatic work or somatic experiencing, sensory integration, things that are more body related so that the processing can happen not just by communication or questioning thoughts because that's not how trauma functions at all right so i really really think it's important to for the trauma therapist to a be trained in different trauma modalities and b have an understanding of uh, autism and how trauma manifests differently in autism and how the sensory pathways are different and how that will act, like, like not trivialize the experience of uh, sitting in an extremely harsh light and that being tra traumatizing or the drilling sound in your society and that being traumatizing, not not ex not diminish that experience but truly truly hold that experience because if they are actually trained in trauma modalities they would know that trauma is very personal and i can't decide what is traumatic for you and otherwise your personal experience of trauma is just you who gets to tell me that hey this was traumatic for me and i can't be the one who judged that no, no. Yeah, well, uh, sorry. I mean, uh, uh, thanks for saying that. Thanks for the response. What I wanted to say was, uh, what I wanted to clarify was, uh, I mean, I did not really understand what, what was, I mean, the, the, the point where you made about 
uh, the, the where we differed. What I was trying to say was uh, if the existing uh, therapeutic techniques actually address trauma, I'm not very. I was not very sure of that, and I was not very sure of the fact how. Ex so that was the question that I was trying to bring about. So I don't know how that came across. So uh, yeah. So so what I was trying to um, uh, what I was trying to imply was that existing. Uh, techniques or, or, or modalities or i mean i, I mean or, uh, that to 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 approach the the to, the, the uh, to address the trauma for in an, uh, might not be sufficient for the autistic individual as of today is what i was trying to imply so that that was what uh, i i don't know I, I, uh, so that that was the point that i was trying to get across but yeah i completely agree with what you yeah, Bye. I, I... I hear you. I hear you, and uh, I agree that I don't think that the that there is enough, even within the trauma modalities. I don't think there is enough research done on autistic with autistic folks and how these trauma modalities function with autistic folks. That's why what I mentioned was that you know it's important that the therapist tailor made can tailor that technique to fit the autistic person's experience it, and not get very rigid about the fact that, hey, I know this technique and this is all that I'm going to do. So I think it's really, really important. That's why it's important for the therapist to have an understanding of what trauma within the autism spectrum can look like and how it can be different. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Thank you uh, both. We have one last question. Um, we are living, unfortunately, in times where difference is demonized. Um, how does disability self-advocacy respond? Any thoughts? I also know it's it's a bit late. So if either of you want to question, uh, respond or even put it in the chat box, that's okay too. I think in general, how to respond to violence and uh, specifically to disability self-advocacy is a couple of points just to keep in mind is one, checking with your boundaries and limits. To what extent can you push? How much can you can hold this for yourself and the other person who is not respecting your existence to assessing safety before engaging with someone. It's unfortunate, but we have to assess our safety before we engage with anyone who is potentially threatening to our being. Three, remember as you do this, when you engage, if you have decided to engage with someone and you feel like it's safe enough for you to do that and you have the resources to handle that, also remember that Educating someone is not your emotional labor and it's completely okay to tap out. Your safety has to be on of priority and it is absolutely the other's labor to figure out why their stance is problematic or why that makes it unsafe for you. So just these things and I know my answer is focused entirely on your safety as you're engaging with this. More than the conversation, I think Generally, also, if you approach anyone or if you have to do this, please, please, please prioritize your safety and know that you don't have to push yourself to be in unsafe spaces. So I think that is the point that's coming to my mind. And um, I hope that works. Yeah. Um, yeah with this, I think... Um, I would want to thank you both on behalf of all of us. Um, thank you for engaging, uh, being vulnerable, bringing your joys, uh, your struggles, your rich experience and wisdom from the community and also these gems of suggestions and a lot of curiosity and questions that we are holding on to right now. Thank you. Thank you, Praveen, and thank you, Anandita. Thank you, Asta, for this absolutely lovely session. 
Um, thank you for being so open, so honest, for sharing your experiences and really letting us all um, be, you know, <laughs> I, I think a part of you also, I suppose, um, allowed yourself to be more vulnerable, even though the space may have seemed safe, and, and I'm glad this space seemed safe enough for you to do that. I know it was very enriching for me to, and very, very insightful for me to listen into your experiences. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. Have a lovely, lovely rest of the Sunday. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Nidhi, there's yeah. one question by Parul Kumta. Ah, okay. Um, I'm okay. Before I take that question, just want to check in because I know I'm, you know, we are well past the time. Uh, before I even go through the question, Asta, Nandita, Praveen, are you all up to taking another question? Can we respond Asta, later by text or email if that's okay? Yeah. I'm awesome. checking with others. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, we can, we can give the email address. People can, like, if anybody wants to send in their questions, I would be more than happy answering them over email yeah. <laughs> because then I'll be able to articulate better. I'm a little shutting down at the moment. So I hope everyone can understand that. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll be sure to do that. And we will, of course, share the link to the recording um, as soon as it's uploaded. But thank you, everybody. Thank you for making it and sharing a Sunday with us. Uh, thank you once again, Anandita, Asta. Thank you, Praveen, for, um, for, for facilitating this. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. Thank you.